Mute. Okay. Uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment uh, here at the University of Utah SJ Quinney College of Law. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this, uh, the final uh, Stegner Center bag for this semester. Uh, but uh, before I introduce our speaker, I should note that uh, we have uh, upcoming programs next semester, and I'd like to highlight uh, a few of them. Uh, First, uh, on January 19th, uh, we will be joined by Professor Jack Schmidt from Utah State University, who will be speaking on the subject of restoring the Colorado River challenges and opportunities. Jack has been directly involved in uh, this effort for any number of years. Uh, on uh, January 28th, National Geographic uh, wildlife photographer Krista uh, Schuyler uh, will be here with us for a presentation uh, over the noon hour on uh, the Continental Divide, uh, wildlife, people, and the border wall, uh, showing photographs and speaking about uh, her. Uh, okay. Speaking about uh, and showing photographs about uh, her work uh, photographing. Uh, the border wall that has been installed between the United States and uh, Mexico in the Southwest. Uh, also, uh, on March uh, 31st and April 1st, we'll be hosting the 21st uh, annual Stegner Center Symposium. This year, the topic is Green Infrastructure, Resilient Cities, New Challenges, New Solutions. So please uh, join us for uh, any or all of those events. Um, I should make a couple of other just quick announcements before uh, making uh, Colin's introduction. Uh, I know that we're a little tight on space here today. We had some conflicting uh, programs, uh, but I understand that across the hall uh, there's an empty room, uh, but with a screen uh, and that the program is being streamed live if anyone is inclined uh, uh, to get over there. Uh, secondly, I wanted to make a shout out to our colleagues uh, and friends and students at Utah State University, uh, Quinney College of Natural Resources, who I understand are tuned in uh, to listen in uh, through our web streaming uh, broadcast of Green Bag uh, today. Uh, welcome uh, to you and everyone in the room. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Colin Battle, uh, who, as uh, many of you are aware, has served as lead counsel in the Weaver River Navigability Adjudication, and he'll be discussing uh, some of his uh, strategies and approaches to that issue today. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, serving in that uh, litigation, uh, Colin uh, works for uh, the law firm of uh, Fabian and Kundenen, Fabian Van Cott. Fabian uh, Van Cott. Currently here in Salt Lake City. He's been with uh, the firm, or at least its president, the firm since 1981. Uh, he received his law degree from the University of Virginia. Uh, he's been actively engaged in public service in a number of different capacities. He served on the Utah Supreme Court's Advisory Committee on Civil Procedure. He served on the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission, uh, also on Salt Lake City's uh, Public Utilities Advisory Committee. 
His areas of practice uh, include public lands and environmental law, public utility law, land use law, and complex real estate and commercial litigation. We also are pleased to have him as an adjunct uh, professor of law where he has taught the environmental law practice class here at the Queen's College of Law. So please join me in welcoming uh, Colin Bapp. Thank you, Bob. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be able to uh, be with you today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the recent case that was tried in uh, the Third District Court in Summit County. Um, the name of the case is Utah Stream Access Coalition versus Park et al. It's uh, been tried uh, and is now on appeal to the Utah Supreme Court. So what I'll talk about is the trial phase of the case. Obviously, uh, the final decision in the, in the matter has not been rendered. Um, and uh, so we'll just, we'll, uh, we'll just focus on the issues as they stand today. Um, the ruling, as I said, the rulings from the Third District Court in Summit County, um, and it declared that Utah Utah's Weber River uh, is a navigable, navigable river that is open to fishing, uh, boating, and other public recreational uses. And this ruling was based largely upon a history of log drives on the Weber River that occurred during the 19th century. Um, I was lead counsel in the case. I was assisted by Craig Coburn, who's here. Craig, why don't you stand up? Uh, he and I were colleagues in this matter together. Um, uh, and I'd like to, before jumping into the details of the case, give you a little bit of information on what was at stake and, and, and why we brought the case. Uh, before 2010, the law in Utah was that all of our rivers, whether they cross public or private lands, were open to the public for any lawful recreational activities that made use of water. Uh, in a series of cases culminating in the case of Conatzer versus Johnson, uh, in in a, a decision in 2008, our Supreme Court ruled that because the public owns the water, flows in a river, uh, the public also holds an easement in the stream bed of the river, uh, and that this easement allows the public to make use of the stream bed insofar as it's reasonable and necessary and incidental to their use of the water. And the ruling specifically held that this includes recreational uses of waters. So the result of the Conatzer case was that even though, even where a river flows through private land and the stream bed is privately owned, a boater or an angler can walk or wade in the stream bed as long as that activity is related to boating or fishing or some other legitimate use of the water. Now this was the law until 2010, when at that time the Utah legislature passed a law known as the Public Waters Access Act, which basically abrogated the public easement that was recognized in Conatzer and closed all stream beds flowing of rivers flowing across private lands to any public use. The only public right that was left in these rivers was to float downstream without touching the shore or the bottom. No waiting is allowed, no stopping, no anchoring. Basically, float through the property and make progress downstream is all that you're allowed to do. Um, now, 43% of all fishable waters in Utah flow through private land and are affected by this statute. Um, and all of those waters are basically wade fishable waters only. In other words, they're not big enough or, or the current is too fast uh, to enable someone to fish these waters from a boat. So essentially the statute closed all fishing access to 43% of the fishable waters in the state of Utah. The impact on boaters was also significant, both in terms of the 
percentage of waters affected, and the extent of the activities that were prohibited by the statute. Uh, not surprisingly, this, this law, the passage of this law, led to some considerable outrage in the outdoors community. And it led to the formation of the Utah Stream Access Coalition. Um, Craig, Craig and I got involved. Um, and we came up with a two-part legal strategy uh, to uh, challenge the statute. First, uh, the first part of that strategy was to bring a case challenging the constitutionality of the statute, uh, basically seeking a return to the law under Conatzer. Um, Craig was, is a lead counsel on that case, and that case was filed first. Um, and then secondly, the second part of the strategy was to go after navigability determinations to reopen access on specific key waters. And let me talk about the reason for pursuing navigability. If a river meets a certain navigability test, and we're going to talk about that test, that's going to be the main part of my talk today, that means the public owns the stream bed. Um, in other words, that stream bed is public property and is therefore not subject to the statute. So that's why we were interested in pursuing navigability as a way of uh, ameliorating the impacts of the stream access statute. Um, so the first case, as I mentioned, uh, Craig filed that on the Provo River uh, in 4th District Court. Uh, and then we brought together the second case, the navigability case on the Weber. Um, and as it turned out, the Weber case went to, even though the book case was filed first, the Weber case went to trial first. And we got our initial decision in April that the Weber is navigable. And it just so happens that, uh, and you may have seen this in the news recently, uh, uh, Craig tried the Provo case and got a successful outcome in that case just recently. But because of the scheduling constraints with the Green Bag series, this, this one was scheduled first, so I'll, have to, I'll just talk about this one. Uh, we'll probably have to do another one of these for, so he can tell you all about the Provo case. The judge um, on the Weaver case with, was Keith Kelly, and the judge on the Provo case was Derek Pullen. So you might, one of the things you, some people are wondering, I know in the outdoor community, um, is, um, is the navigability ruling still um, valuable in light of the ruling in the Provo case, which completely overturns the stream access law and returns us to the law under Conatzer. Um, and uh, I, I, I maintain that the, the answer to that question is yes, it is still a valuable ruling for a couple of reasons. First of all, both cases are on appeal. There's no guarantee what will happen to either one of them. Um, and even if both cases are upheld on appeal, uh, the, navig the navigability ruling will have some independent value. First of all, and primarily, navigability means that the public owns the stream bed. Um, not just a right to use it, but owns it. The, and, uh, the driving, and the driving force behind the stream access statute um, in the legislature was a sentiment that if the stream bed is privately owned, it is unfair to impose an easement on it allowing public use. It's unfair to the property owner. Um, basically, the legislature saw that as a taking of private property rights, and, any, and it even said so in the preamble to the statute. Now, um, as misguided as I believe these sentiments to be, they are very real. Um, establishing public ownership avoids the, avoids the problem of private property rights altogether. Basically, if it wasn't yours to begin with, uh, it can't be taken from you. So we feel like navigability is an important issue to pursue and to continue to pursue regardless of what happens with the stream access statute on appeal. So let's get to the meat of the subject for today, which is the navigability 
test and how it was applied in this case. Basically, I've, I've put up for you a synthesis of the, what the law is. Um, uh, this is sort of the, this sort of encapsulates everything that we had to prove in the Weaver case. Rivers are navigable when at statehood, and that's a very key, uh, con uh, that's a very key part of this, um, when they are used or susceptible of being used in their ordinary and natural condition as highways for commerce over which trade and travel are or may be conducted in the customary modes of trade and travel on water. That's it. Now there's a lot of stuff loaded in there. And I'm, what I'm gonna do today is kind of walk you through each of these elements and how they were applied in the Weaver, in the case of the, the Weaver navigability trial. This test originated uh, with some Supreme Court decisions way back into the 1800s. And some of the, it started with a case, the Daniel Ball in 1871. It was further refined into a test that determined title to the riverbed uh, through the United States versus Utah case, which I'll talk about some more later. Uh, and it was most recently affirmed in a Supreme Court decision involving some rivers in Montana, uh, in, in the PPL Montana versus Montana case. Um, one of the things that's most interesting about this is to, is to think about and ask the question, well, where does this, where does this test come from? And, and where is it said that the public necessarily owns the stream bed of any river that meets this test? Well, that requires us to get into some pretty ancient stuff about the formation of our nation. Um, and it really starts with Article 4 of the United States Constitution, which has been interpreted to mean that basically all states are created equal and have to be equal. Um, we don't have first class states and we don't have second class states. Um, and that this notion embedded in Article 4 of the Constitution led to language that is found in the Enabling Acts for every state that's been admitted to the Union stating that it is entering the Union on equal footing with the original 13 colonies and with any of, every other state that preceded it into the Union. Um, so what does this have to do with navigable waters? Well, the original 13 colonies owned the beds of all navigable waters in those colonies. That was an idea that was imported from England where the crown owned the beds of all navigable waters, supposedly for the benefit of all its subjects. But in the colonies, the, they, they modified that rule uh, to provide that for direct ownership by the people uh, uh, in, 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 instead of ownership by the crown. And because it, so because it was this way in the colonies, courts have said, uh, that it must be so in every state that was subsequently admitted into the Union. Uh, under the equal footing doctrine, therefore, the people own the beds of the navigable rivers and title will be transferred to them at statehood as an incident of statehood. This is a rule of federal law, uh, but it's a rule of federal law that primarily applies uh, at the state level. Um, but basically, our right, our ownership of the beds of the Nagual waters derives from federal law. And so we have, in the Weaver case, as, we, as has happened in many other cases before us dealing with Nagual waters, we're asking a state court to apply federal law to determine what, whether or what waters are navigable under federal law within that state. Um, anyway, that was, so that was the basic compact, and uh, all that was left was to determine which of the streams were navigable for tidal purposes. Uh, turns out that's no small feat. Uh, 
Unfortunately, uh, there was no list of rivers in any state at statehood uh, that were navigable. Uh, instead, this test in slide two was to develop to determine navigability after the fact of statehood. Um, and in most states, including Utah, there was no systematic effort after statehood to go out and inventory and determine which of the streams were navigable and thus would be owned by the people. Um, and instead, over the years, states have made various claims to various rivers for various reasons. Um, some of those claims have been adjudicated, others are just claimed. Um, and so have citizens groups, just like the Utah Stream Access Coalition. Um, but whether you are a state or just a member of the public who wants to know whether you can use a river or not, you basically have to go to court to find out whether it's navigable and you have to use that standard. So I'm going to show you a map. Um, this is the map of the rivers and waters in Utah that the state of Utah recognized as navigable at the time we filed the Weaver case. Um, some uh, are indicated, some are merely claimed. Uh, as you can see, we've got the lake beds of Utah Lake and Great Salt Lake, both adjudicated, both in cases versus the federal government, who was the owner of the land around the shore that is contending that the lake was non the lakes were non-navigable, and therefore, government owned the, the beds. Uh, the other rivers of note are the Green and the Colorado, and you can sort of see them off in the lower right-hand side. Um, all of, just individual portions, um, and also the Jordan River between Utah Lake and Great Salt Lake, and the Lower Bear where it, where it re-enters Utah after flowing through Wyoming and Idaho and comes back into Utah is, uh, has portions of this have been adjudicated and the remaining portions are claimed uh, way from the state line to the Great Salt Lake. Um, most of this mileage, uh, the great percentage of it, is on, is all, is on public land already. Uh, and the portions uh, and whatever is on private land is not particularly good for boating or for fishing. Uh, so it's from the, in the minds of the Stream Access Coalition, uh, existing navigable waters were not particularly helpful in offsetting the impacts of the statute. Um, and um, it was, uh, so the, coalition decided that it was not likely that the state was going to uh, go out and pursue navigability determinations on any rivers, uh, so it decided to do so on its own, and, is, uh, and we knew that, um, that if we were going to use uh, navigability as a means of offsetting or alleviating the impacts of the stream access, we would have to file the cases ourselves, and we would have to try to expand the envelope of rivers that meet the navigability test in Utah. One of the reasons that we chose the Weber River for this uh, is that we had heard stories about log drives in the 19th century um, around the time of statehood. Um, we knew that we weren't going to find evidence of sort of what you would say is classic uh, navigation on the Weber. We knew that there weren't going to be steamships traveling up and down or barges or anything like that. But we thought that log drives might be a sufficient basis for establishing navigability. Um, and the other reason, the other main reason we initially chose the Weaver is that it represents probably the, the greatest single loss of access as a result of the statute. The Weaver is pretty much private land or flows through private land um, from top to bottom. Uh, and it's also one of Utah's premier 
fishing and boating streams. Um, so we made the decision to look at the weaver as the weaver that we would bring our navigability test on. Um, now, when we dug into the stories about these log drives in the 19th century, we basically found that they were um, pretty long on color, but short on detail. Uh, they were mostly popular history articles uh, written without any primary source citations, no, no peer review. Um, uh, basically just legend and lore that had been passed down over, the, over generations and, and put into popular history articles for the public to read. Um, we knew that we couldn't rely on that as our sole evidence in court. And in fact, we knew that to be successful in a case based solely on log drives, we would probably have to prove the following points, and we would probably need real history to do it. We would need to show when the log drives occurred, specifically in relation to statehood, which is 1896, for those of you who didn't know that. Um, we would need to show where they occurred, where on the river, which stretches of the river were involved, um, basically where the drives began and where they ended. Um, we need to show that the log drives actually worked uh, and that sufficient quantities of logs or timber products were successfully transported to their final destination such that it could be said that the drives represented a useful form of commerce. We would need to show that the river was capable of sustaining log drives in its ordinary condition, not just during some freak flood event. And finally, we would have to show that the log drives represented a customary mode of transporting timber products at the time in question. Basically, those are the things that we derived from this legal test that we felt we would need to prove in order to be successful in a case involving log drives. So, um, and we would need real history to do that. Trouble is, there wasn't any real history of log drives or the logging industry in Utah. Um, a lot of history on mining, a lot of history on the railroads, almost nothing on the logging industry. Um, so we had to create history of our own from scratch. Um, and, and what we did, we formed a team of volunteers from the Stream Access Coalition uh, to do the work, to do the historical research. One of them was a marketing director for a major online retailer. One was in the process of getting a joint MD, PH degree in genetics. Another was a patent specialist. Even I got sucked into it, even though I wasn't supposed to. But none of us was a historian. And uh, so we had to go out and get one. And we found Professor Sarah Dant. Uh, she's a professor of Western American history at Weaver State University. And she agreed to serve as our expert in the case and to come on board and to, uh, be, and to direct these research activities that our, our team of volunteers was performing. Um, one of the first things we found once we started to do this uh, that was helpful was uh, we found a 60-year-old unpublished PhD thesis that was buried in the bowels of the University of Colorado um, that covered an element of the logging industry that would turn out to be central in our case, the railroad tie industry. Um, this gentleman, it was written in the 1950s. It was written, it was interesting that, that, that the professor who sponsored the thesis became one of uh, the, the leading historians of the American West. And the, and the student who wrote it also became a, a, a successful historian. Uh, he, he moved to the East Coast and uh, did a lot of similar work there. But he wrote a story, a history of the railroad tie industry in the central Colorado, in the central Rockies that unfortunately for us was limited to Wyoming and Colorado and it just and it just stopped right at the Utah border. But it did give us 
something very valuable. Um, it gave us a picture of how the industry worked. Uh, and uh, particularly the way the loggers and the tie cutters used rivers to transport their railroad ties from the mountains where they were cut to the rail lines where they were needed. And most importantly, it showed us what we had to look for in Utah and the kind of primary sources that we could hope to find regarding this activity in Utah. And then when we, so when we turned our attention to Utah and what we could find there, we found that we sort of had, there were two big advantages that we had of, for doing this work in Utah. One was the LDS Church and its massive archives of family and personal history. Um, and it's actually, uh, it's not just collected, but it's actually cataloged. And you can search through these materials using subjects like railroad ties, logging, rivers, specific rivers. And by accessing these sources, we found uh, these priceless histories of individuals who were involved in the logging industry, uh, or, and probably most commonly, histories by their children, written later, detailing the, detailing the uh, facts and circumstances of their parents' lives. And one, of the, one in particular that was really helpful was um, uh, a biography written, written by a woman named Emily Sompson about her, and it was basically dealing, in, in a, a significant part of that dealt with her father, Henry Sompson, who was a foreman on a logging crew, cutting railroad ties and floating them down the Weber River to Echo, in the, uh, the town of Echo in the 1870s. Um, these, her accounts were sort of similar to the popular histories, and in fact, the, wrote the popular histories, probably got their information from her biography, although it wasn't, we had to go rediscover it because they weren't cited. But, um, but so again, it was sort of, didn't have a whole lot of detail, but it certainly gave you a lot of color uh, 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 that was helpful. And, um, and, uh, uh, and, and it, more importantly, what it gave us is something upon which we could then direct our efforts in, the, in using the other big advantage that we had in doing this work in Utah, which was the fact that we have one of the most developed archives of digital, of old digital newspapers, or I should say old newspapers that, have, that are now digitized, uh, that go back, uh, that are available online, have been converted to word searchable text uh, that will enable you to research newspaper articles going clear back to original settlement. Now, these resources are probably more advanced in Utah than just about anywhere in the country because of efforts of the Marriott Library. They were one of the leaders in, in doing this. They did it in conjunction with some folks at the national level. But Utah was kind of used as a test case for getting as many of these old newspapers online as you could. And so we were... Um, we were able to use the journals to then start digging into these newspaper archives. Uh, and, um, uh, we were, and, and I'm going to show you some of the stuff we found um, by doing this. We, we would not have been able to do this. If, if this stuff had not been digitized, I don't think we could have found any of it. I don't know if anyone here has done old newspaper research the old-fashioned way by scrolling through microfilm. I mean, it's, you get a good image of the newspaper, but you can't, you, you just have to browse it. And if you're not looking, if you don't have a specific time, place, or point in history that you're looking at, it's nearly impossible. You go blind just trying to scroll through and browse through paper after paper looking for something. 
Uh, so we were able to use word searches in specific papers at specific times to come up with stuff like this. Now this is uh, this is a uh, this is from the Deseret Evening News, uh, July 16, 1877, and on the left side I've sort of showed you what the entire paper looked like. This is what you see on the microfilm. Uh, but then you can zoom in and you can see I've got the little red squiggly line outlining the article. And here's the article that's uh, over on the right side blown up so you can read it. talks about, it's a report from, this is Salt Lake, Pioa, and was about the first community that was settled in the Weber Valley. They didn't have a newspaper. Um, Echo didn't have a newspaper. Um, so you, we're, you're just picking up fragments of news that rep were reported in the Salt Lake papers at this time. But we hear from uh, Mr. Edmund Walker that, that frost is visited four times in June, damaging the potato crops. Otherwise, the people are in excellent health. And by the way, railroad ties that have been cut in the East Weber Mountains are being floated down to Weber in large numbers to echo. Um, this turns out to be one of the drives that Emily Sompson's father was conducting. And it, we, 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 we found other things like this. Uh, Deseret News, December 28, 1881. 100 woodchoppers to cut ties for the Union Pacific Railroad on the Weaver River and its branches. <laughs> Um, a report in 1890 of a man of a company named Kidder Brothers have had all of their logs driven down the Weber River to a point at one ship and then even as late as 1896 this is a pretty important one because this is just shortly after statehood um, Broad gauge railroad ties are in demand. The Salt Lake and Pacific is getting out a large number in the Weber Canyon, but the supply is not equal to the demand, and the company is looking around for other sources. Um, this is a map that we developed. This is what uh, northeastern Utah looked like in 1896. Using these sources, these newspaper articles, these family histories, biographies, and, and such, uh, we started to piece together a story of what was going on in the region at the, at the time. And um, it, there was a booming industry. It was involved four different rivers, the Black's Fork, which spend much time in Utah before it enters uh, Wyoming. The, the Upper Bear River, the Weber, and the Provo. All of these rivers start in the mountains, start in the Uinta Mountains, and you can see they start in a, uh, you know, they, they, their headwaters are very close to one another. It's basically they're draining the western half of the Uinta Mountains. Uh, and they're flowing out to rail heads. Uh, the, initially, the railheads being on the Transcontinental Railroad that was completed in 1869, and then later as the rail line, uh, as the line expanded to different rail points. But we found is that the, these industries were shipping their logs down the river, or floating their logs down the river to the nearest railhead. And so that gave us a sense that these were the highways of commerce that existed at the time, and the Weber uh, being one of them. Um, as, to the, as to the Weber, we, 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 got, we had some good information about where the logs were going. Initially, they were going to uh, Echo, Echo City. Let me see if I can point that out here. Can you guys see the cursor? Um, Echo City right there. Um, that would have been the railhead uh, that existed uh, when the Transcontinental was built. 
uh, trans transcontinental came through Wyoming, passed through Echo City, and then went on out. Uh, that was the Union Pacific portion of the transcontinental. And then later, um, a line was built in 1880 from Echo up to Park City that went up the Weaver River and last crossed it at Wanship. So we, we, we got a very strong uh, sense, and, and, and there was doubt about it, that the destination for all these log drives was initially Echo and then later Wanship. Basically, the first place that the river meets the railroad. Um, didn't know where they started. Uh, and that was, you know, as I indicated earlier, that was sort of a key component. To, to have a highway of commerce, you have, to have a, you have to have a starting point, an ending point. And we suspected that it was up in the upper reaches of the Weber at a place called Holiday Park, um, which is where the road ends today if you drive up Weber Canyon. Uh, it's where all the forks of the Weaver come together, and it's also where the best forests are. It's the most heavily forested area of the river. So we thought that that's probably where these drives were starting, but we didn't really have a way to prove that until we, um, we went back and we looked at Emily Thompson's biography again, and she, in her biography, she now, she's an older woman now, and she tells of how she tells a story about a guy named George Carter, one of the men on her father's crew who was drowned in a in a trying to break up a log jam during a tie drive. Um, he was drowned on the Weaver, and she she talks about how um, many years later, as an older woman, she was she and her husband were driving up the Weaver River. She didn't say where, but they were driving up the river, and she found the gravestone that her father had placed at the point where Mr. Carter had drowned. And she talked about how much that meant to her and how emotional that was. But we got to thinking about it, wait a minute, and this was in the 1950s when she wrote this, and she made this journey up the river and found this gravestone. So we got to thinking, maybe, maybe, we, can, maybe we can find that too. Uh, we didn't know where it was. We, we suspected that it was in the upper part of the river. So we sent someone up there to look for it. And uh, he talked to a bunch of the old timers and locals. And sure enough, he found, this is what he found. Out in the middle of nowhere, kind of on a bluff overlooking the river. I don't know if you can read that, but it's... It says, George Carter drowned in the in tie drive on Weaver River, spring of 1877, Henry Sompson Foreman. Now, um, best for all, it was great. This was a great thing to find. I mean, talk about some sort of powerful evidence of what was really going on up there. Uh, but the best part about it was where we found it. Basically, way up the river, uh, even above uh, the, 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 the first major tributary below, the, below Holiday Park is Smith Morehouse Creek. This is, so this is above the confluence, Smith Morehouse Creek. Pretty much, is, pretty much established that the, log, at least the log drive that George Carter dr died in must have originated in Holiday Park. Um, by the way, uh, when we found this, uh, the guy who found it contacted the uh, Summit County Historical Society and said, hey, you guys need to do something about it. this. Is, this is a significant historical site. You know, and so if you drive up the Weaver River today, this wasn't the case when we found it, but if you drive up today, you'll see a nice little historical marker on the side of the road. And if you hop the fence, and apparently the landowner is fine with people doing this, you can walk over to where the bluff looks over the river, and you'll see this grave. Um, so uh, basically, using evidence like this, uh, we were, we were, um, 
able to sort of piece together a picture uh, uh, and a timeline of log drives on the river that basically looks something like this. And um, let's go back to slide eight. Um, uh, the Transcontinental River, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed to Echo in 1869, right here. Um, uh, the first, and that the ties used for the initial construction of the Transcontinental were, were supplied by, at least at this portion of it, were supplied by drives down the Bear and the Black's Fork Rivers down the Bear to Evanston, down the Black's Fork to Granger. Um, the first documented tie drive on the Weber in eight, was in 1877. That's the drive that George Carter drowned in. Uh, Holiday Park to Echo. The ties were used for various Union Pacific purposes. We uh, were able to show that a similar drive occurred, and that was 1877. We were able to show that a similar drive occurred in 1879, and that two different drives occurred in 1880, consisting of 60,000 railroad ties each uh, that were used to build the, there were actually two rail lines originally built from Echo City, Echo to Park City. Um, at the same time, they were sort of competing. They were trying to get there first. It was sort of like the transcontinental all over again, except they did it parallel. <laughs> um, the, uh, and there's an interesting story behind that as well. Probably don't have time to tell it. But, um, but anyway, 120,000 ties were needed just for that uh, connecting, that line running from Echo to Park City. Um, after that line was completed, the railhead for the Weber River moves upstream from Echo to Wanship. And then thereafter, um, we have, uh, in 1881, 42,000 ties were driven from the upper Weber to Wanship, and these were used to construct the Oregon Short Line Railroad, which uh, was built out of Granger, Wyoming, and headed to the northwest. Um, that similar drives for the Oregon Short Line occurred from Upper Weber to Wanship in 82 and probably in 1883. And that a final tri drive in all likelihood occurred in 1896 in the year of statehood. And that was one of the newspaper pieces that I showed you. Um, the evidence, this kind of evidence also led us to be able to show that in addition to railroad tie drives on the Weber, uh, once the mining industry started booming in Park City uh, in the late 1870s and the 1880s, there was a significant demand for two other types of timber, uh, mining timbers to shore up the mine shafts, uh, and cordwood that was used to uh, uh, that was used to generate charcoal that was then used for various purposes. Uh, probably most significantly in the mine smelters uh, that were located around Park City. Uh, as the coal mines in Colville developed, uh, the, the need for charcoal tapered off. Uh, but nevertheless, there were significant drives of cordwood and mining timbers down the Weaver, mostly in uh, the early uh, 1880s. Um, Bottom line, uh, you know, the, we presented all of this evidence and uh, we were able to, I think, paint a picture with words. Unfortunately, we didn't have any pictures. We could never find a picture of a tie drive on the Weber River. And boy, we looked and looked and looked and looked for that. So we, so we had to paint a picture with words, but we did find some pictures of tie drives on other rivers, on other rivers that we hoped our our words gave an impression similar to this. Um, that's what a tie drive looked like on the Black's Fork. Now, the Black's Fork is a smaller river than the Weber. Um, 
so imagine this, uh, and there is a river running underneath those logs. And it's moving pretty fast. Uh, I don't think that's a log jam. Uh, I think that's the way it looked when they dumped all of these railroad ties in the river and they took off all at once. Um, we were, you know, we were able to show that this was commerce, that this was a highway of commerce, that this was the best way to transport uh, large quantities of timber products from way up in the mountains at a time when we didn't have roads, we certainly didn't have trucks. I mean, the only other option was to try to haul these things by an ox cart. I mean, look at this picture. You know, how long is it going to take to haul that amount of timber? I mean, even if you get a road, and eventually a road was built uh, into the upper Weber, and we had reports of people trying to drive, trying to travel that road in the 1890s, and what a miserable journey it was. Uh, but um, it became pretty clear that this was about the only way you could get it done that this was a useful form, a useful mode of transport. It was the only mode of transport. And uh, it, we didn't have steamships, we didn't have barges, uh, but the, the river was the highway that enabled the transport of this material to where it was needed. That's, uh, you know, and the court bought the evidence and uh, the ruling was that the weaver is navigable. Um, Any questions? I'd be happy to. Uh, how much time do we have left? We, we're probably running a little short, but if what? Yeah. I would think they could only do this when the river is flooded. So that leads to the question of how do you define the river bed? Yeah. Does that mean more we have to expand on the sun time? That's a, that was a big question in the case uh, because as we let's jump back to our test. You would see the reference to ordinary and natural condition. Our position was that um, the river, we, these, these log drives occurred during ordinary high water. And uh, that ordinary high water lasted uh, two, maybe three months a year. Uh, the, other side protested that, my gosh, you can only do this two months a year. That's, that's uh, that, that river is, you know, only two months a year. Uh, what we, but the point that we made and the point that the court ultimately accepted was it's not so much how many months a year this can be done that matters. It's whether that amount of time was sufficient that people would actually organize an industry around it uh, and would actually found it useful, a useful way. And sure enough, I mean, and this isn't just true on the Weber, this was the case with all of the log drives across all the Rocky Mountains. It's a different situation in the Northwest, yes. It's different in the Midwest. But in the Rocky Mountains and in this part of the country, all the log drives were done the same way during ordinary high water. They were trying to catch the peak runoff, and they did it quick. They would go up into the mountains all winter long and cut the ties or the mining timbers or the cord wood. Um, and they would sled it down over the snow to the bank of the river. And they would, we had some pictures of what this looked like in the 1930s when they were doing it. They went back up on the bear and the, and the uh, Blacks Fork and resume this stuff in the, in the actually, in the 1920s and 30s, and the, and that's be, and that was documented. That, there's some pretty good documentation of that. But what they would do is they would and they, and they had this down to a science. Uh, in fact, we found a dissertation that some guy had done about how did the business plan for one of these operations in 1930. But they had it down to a science. They would they would drag all these logs and stack them up right along the riverbanks. Huge, 
huge piles. And then the foreman would wait, would accumulate all winter long, and then the foreman would wait and then give the signal at the time he thought it was good to go. And they would smash the props that were holding up these piles and the logs would just tumble into the river all at once and off they would go. And they didn't always guess right. They sometimes had some hung up drives. And you can imagine, they didn't have the resources we have today, weather forecasting and river forecasting, it's great. You can go online and see the chart of your river, when it's going to go up and when it's projected to go down and how fast. They, didn't have, they had to just guess. And they were pretty new to the country. So you know they made mistakes. And in fact, there were some drives that didn't make it. They got started and then they got hung up. And they stayed there all year until the next spring could wash them out. And occasionally there were some years where it was, there wasn't enough water ever. And, you know, we're familiar with those kinds of years. We're having more of them now, it seems like, than they had. But uh, it didn't always work, but it worked enough. It worked uh, enough times so that this industry developed and flourished from about 1869 in Utah through the 1890s. It was on the Provo, the Bear, the Black's Fork, the Weber, and then some other rivers up in Cache Valley. And it even, and, it's, and one of the most surprising things I learned was it even continued in, on the Bear and the Black's Fork into the 1920s and 30s. The last tide drive was in 1940 on the Wind River in Wyoming. That's as far as we can tell. And, and, it, 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 and so it took that long. I mean, we had trucks and transportation systems pretty well developed by then, and it took that long. It's basically the technology that was developed between World War I and World War II, the large trucks that eventually eclipsed uh, the railroad ties, and the Union Pacific issued an edict that it was not going to accept any more ties that were floated down rivers. At that point, it was all by truck. But this is... Uh, this, this tells you something about the practice. This tells you that it was useful. Well, for, for navigability, the title, so, so I, as I mentioned, if it's navigable, we own the bed. So Dave's question is, well, how much do we own? That's well settled. Ordinary high water mark, everything below it is considered part of, uh, is considered the stream bed, and is public property. The ordinary high water mark is not always totally obvious, but it is something that can be surveyed, and surveyors are trained how to do this. Uh, but it's basically where the vegetation changes, uh, where you get upland vegetation versus aquatic ve vegetation. You can, you know, if you're a fisherman or a boater, you can pretty well tell where the ordinary high water mark. It's basically the point that the river comes to year after year after year. It's not always coming to exactly the same spot because you have high water years and low water years. But it, it, it re results in a change of the vegetation pattern and oftentimes a change in the sedimentation. And so you can see a, a scarp or a bank that sort of tells you that this is where the water comes to. That's the boundary, the ordinary high water mark. And that's what's owned by the public if the river's navigable. Other questions? Yeah. Do you think you're exempt if there were pretty rough bolts that they were floating? Did your nest discovery solve them or take away from this? Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. The, the way this, uh, the way this Thai um, industry worked, it was beautiful in its simplicity. These guys went up into the mountains in the wintertime and all they had were axes and, saw, and hand saws. Big, broad axes and hand saws. They didn't have sawmills. They didn't need sawmills. They would, and, and this is why we thought Holiday Park was likely the area that was started, because that's when you get into the lodgepole pines. They were, they were trying to create railroad ties that were basically six to seven inches, six by seven. And either six and a half or eight feet long, depending upon whether it's narrow gauge or broad gauge. And so the best way to do that, the easiest way to do that, 
is to find a lodgepole pine that's about, you know, this big at the bottom and, and, and then you know how they taper. They, they're just straight uh, all the way up to where it's about 10 inches. Cut that tree down and then use a broad ax to shave four sides and you've got, and then you cut them up into eight foot sections and you've got your railroad ties. They basically manufactured the railroad ties on the spot where they cut the trees. And that's what you saw floating. That, those are all railroad ties. These are, they, they haul these, whoop, they haul those things out of the river. They have a boom, a granger, and it, it collects them into a massive pond, and they have these conveyor belts that just haul them out of the river, dump them onto a flatbed, and off they go. They're done. Yeah, John? State is not appealing the Weber case. The landowners are, and the state is appealing the Provo case. Yeah, they're ready to compromise now. <laughs> but we told them before, it's, you know, compromised before, not after. So it's kind of too late for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had we had a lot of it, um, and uh, but it wasn't. We did find stuff as we went along. I mean, and I tell you, there's more. I'm convinced there's more out there. I don't think we got it all. Yes. No. Well. We discovered uh, there's a wonderful rule of evidence that I didn't even know about that says that anything that's been published for 30 years can be offered for the truth of the matter asserted, and that's an exception to the hearsay rule. <laughs> it's great. You know, you might ask, well, you know, newspapers, you know, well, why does 30 years make it suddenly true? But apparently it does. That's the rule. The other, way, the, the other way you get it in is through your expert. Uh, you know, the ex if, if the expert says, this is the sort of stuff we historians rely upon, you know, even though it's hearsay or would be considered hearsay, um, you can get it in as matters that were relied upon by your expert. We didn't have a problem. I mean, we all agreed uh, up front. Everyone was using this kind of evidence. I mean, uh, the landowners had lots of evidence about hung drives and disasters and stuff like that. And, you know, they were using that to argue that this was a crazy practice, not a useful practice, that people died and, it, it, you know. And so it, it was a fair fight. We all, we all agreed to let it all in and, 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 and let the judge make of it what he will. And that's, that's sort of how we handled it. But I think that if, if we'd have had evidentiary objections to this stuff, we could have overcome them. It is in perpetuity. And it cannot be, you can't unring that bell, ever. No use? Well, Who's to say we're not going to have some other use? I mean, who can predict? I mean, yes, it was, it was used and useful for railroad ties, and we'll probably never use it for that again. But who can predict what we might need these rivers for in the future? We use it for fishing now. I mean, in commerce right now, um, fishing guides taking their clients down the river. Isn't that, that, isn't that commerce? Now, that wasn't going on at statehood. And you cannot use at least seems pretty well settled. I wish it were otherwise, but uh, it's pretty well settled that you can use modern day evidence of modern day recreational, even, even commercial recreation, to establish navigability under this test because it has to be at statehood. It has, you have to show that it, it was either used or susceptible of being used at statehood, and that's what triggers the magical transfer of title upon statehood from the federal sovereign 
who owned the riverbeds before to the people of the new state, us today. And that's a perpetual grant. Yes, yes. Uh, the pr yeah. Uh, the number one uh, competitor f with uh, Weber is the Provo. In fact, we ended up finding more evidence on the Provo than the Weber. But they were pretty much, they were very comparable. The reason, that, the reason we think we found more evidence on the Provo was because the drives on the Provo were later, uh, more in the 1880s and 1890s in relation to the Denver and Rio Grande and the railroads that came later in time. Plus, the Provo drives ended in the city of Provo and there were newspapers in Provo and this was a matter of great interest to the people and so you just found more articles about what was going on on the Provo but we felt like there was must have been pretty similar in terms of volume and frequency the, yeah it's it's uh, the thing about using log drives is you've got to have certain ingredients for this to work um, it's not just about is the stream big enough to float a log or a bunch of logs I mean, there are plenty of rivers in southern Utah that could do that, but they never were used, and they never would have been used, and they never could have been used because there were no forests. Uh, I mean, these were desert rivers, and, and so you didn't have the timber resources to, to make that a viable um, practice. Yes, there may have been in isolated instances where people found found some trees, uh, cottonwoods or something along the river and threw up a sawmill and cut the trees upstream and floated them down to their sawmill. Yeah, that was going on. Uh, but we felt it would be better to have a systematic practice, an industry developed around it uh, to, to make this case. You know, one of the biggest arguments, against, and one of the main arguments against us, and the one that's probably going to get the most play on appeal, is the defendants, their position that it ain't navigability unless you have a boat. You navigate boats, you don't navigate logs. Um, our response, and the judge bought it, is that yeah, this, this, this test is called the navigability test. That is just the label that is used, but the test itself does not use the word navigate. The test does not say, it doesn't say boat. Um, it says highway of commerce. And so we, that's, that's what we have to prove. But this is going to be, this is going to be one of the big arguments on appeal. And we feel like the best way to meet that argument is to show not just sporadic sort of isolated occurrences but a systematic practice. Yeah. Oh, this ruling um, concerned a single one mile segment of the Weber River because, because we're not the state and we can't commence an adjudication the way the state could, could do if they, if they were so inclined. We have to find a spot where our members are being denied access. Um, and uh, we have to have, find a landowner who's willing to fight. Because a lot of them, the minute we send them a letter, say, hey, oh, we, you know, you guys can, you know, we're not interested in a lawsuit. So um, we had to, you know, we needed someone who would fight us on this. I know that sounds weird, but that's the way it was. And, um, and so there was a group of landowners uh, in Pioa, right? Where, it's right where, you know, the Browns Canyon Road that goes from uh, Park City over to, to towards Pioa, where it crosses the Weber, the, this group of properties, some are above the bridge and some are below it. That was our test case. And the court's ruling only applies to that one mile reach. And so we've told people, don't, don't try to fish there. You, 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 you won't know where it begins or where it ends 
I'm not talking about the high water mark now. I'm talking about where upstream and downstream it ends. So these properties are not marked. You know, we've got to have this case decided on appeal. And then if the court validates our position, then we will look to the state of Utah to go forth and stake out the full, the full navigability. Uh, and and we, would, we would expect, based upon the evidence that was presented, that that would, at a minimum, have to be Holiday Park to Echo. Now, below Echo, you know, we weren't focusing on that. There may be more evidence. We don't know. But certainly we think that based upon the rule, if, if Judge Kelly is upheld by the Supreme Court, that, that means Holiday Park to Echo will be navigable and of public ownership. On the Provo? Because it's defending its statute. Probably a better question is why was the state opposing us on the Weaver? Because we're actually, we were asserting the state's claim. Mike Johnson's here. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Mike. Actually, Mike is a great lawyer. Doug Crapo is with him. They, they tried the case, and it was a pleasure. And, and uh, uh, we, didn't, we weren't aligned with the state but, but, uh, uh, because they were not sure. They did not feel comfortable asserting navigability based upon the log drives and the evidence that we had. Um, we were hoping that Judge Kelly's ruling would, now I'm not talking about Mike and Doug, I'm talking about their client here. We were hoping that Judge Kelly's ruling might embolden them. And it doesn't appear that that's happened. Um, but, we'll, but I think if it's upheld by the Supreme Court, that will. And that they, that they will start the normal process of staking it out the way they have on other rivers around the state. Yeah. Yeah. People would come in and put cards to, to make sure that their, their banks didn't get taken away. But what did he do? One year he lost about a quarter of an acre. Yeah. Property. But what happened is people put cards up and the river moved over here and it was took a big, huge chunk right out of the property. Mm hmm. Right. Well, it, it's 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 the logical next question. Uh, if the river is navigable, and if it's if the bed is publicly owned, then then you have a property boundary issue. And well, uh, maybe, but uh, uh, what that. Ownership, the state's or the public ownership is considered what's called a movable freehold. In other words, it moves with nature. Those rivers do not, as you know, those rivers don't stay in one place, especially a river like the Weber. And, uh, and so when you have a river that's serving as a boundary between two private property owners, for example, a non-navigable river, the boundary line will, is the center of the river. And as that river moves, so does that boundary. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Uh, it's going to be basically the same thing. And whether artificial alterations to either prevent or, or accelerate that process, I don't think it will be allowed, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, yeah and you've got to get a permit. Plus, you know, once it's, uh, once it's public property, you, you, know, uh, you would have to get permission from the state. Are we done? Uh, yes, I think we've uh, exhausted our time. Uh, in this room. Let me thank you again for joining us. Uh, let me remind you that on the 19th of January and again on the 28th, we have the upcoming programs uh, that I noted. Uh, and let me ask you to join me in thanking.